This is From the Courtroom to the Boardroom, the podcast for the next generation of legal leaders with me, Simon Gibson. I was a lawyer for 13 years until I walked away from legal practice and entered the world of business. I'm now CEO of the Spirant Group and I lead a portfolio of businesses in the UK and Australia. On this upbeat podcast, I tackle the big issues facing law firms and businesses alike with the help of intriguing guests. Are you ready to rewrite the script? Then it's great to have you along for the ride. Hello, friends. Welcome to the podcast. Hope you're all well. We're talking neurodiversity in the legal sector, in business, and in society today. Both of my daughters, Darcy and Amelia, are dyslexic. And Amelia has been recently diagnosed with ADD, which is Attention Deficit Disorder. I think we're going to get on later to whether that's a helpful label to give an 11-year-old. But I've got really interested in this area, which is neurodiversity. And I've got to thinking, how could this apply to the legal sector? What are the opportunities for neurodiverse people within the legal sector? What are the barriers? How could law firms and other businesses in and around the sector benefit from opening up the boundaries that I think do exist to um, people who are autistic or dyslexic or have another particular diagnosis in terms of neurodiversity. So my guests this time are the leaders of the MAPT group. That's Brian Cullen and Joanna Kingston-Davis. I'm really thrilled that Brian and Joanna have taken the time to join us in this discussion. Um, MAPT group, I think you will have seen a lot about in the legal press. They're an alliance of law firms who've got a very focused ideology in terms of their values and in terms of what they uh, want to bring to the firms within the alliance. They've got a lot on. You will have seen some acquisitions they've made recently. So not only I think Brian and Joanna will make a really valuable contribution to this conversation, but it'd be fascinating to hear what they've been up to and and, and what their plans are for the future. Um, I think where we're going to take the conversation is perhaps start off with what are we talking about when we think about neurodiversity? bit about personal experiences. I know Brian and Joanna have both got some personal experiences, as have I, as I've mentioned. And then we'll move through, well, what are the opportunities and what are the disadvantages both to businesses looking to embrace workforce, which includes people who are neurologically diverse. And then we might move on to opportunities and solutions to any challenges that people with those sort of diagnoses face. So as ever... Really appreciate your company. Relax, enjoy the episode. Uh, It's from the courtroom to the boardroom. Me, Simon Gibson, and we're talking neurodiversity in the legal sector, workplace, and society. Brian, Joanna, thank you so much for doing this. Great to see you. Good to see you, Sam. Thanks for having us. Well, it's it's lovely that you've, you've, you've joined us. I mean, where this all came from was I ran into you both at a Nat West dinner um, a few months back. And we got chatting about our personal experience because I mentioned to you that my both my girls have been diagnosed with dyslexia and recently uh, Amelia with ADD. You both shared with me that you had some similar personal experiences. We chatted about all of the personal channel challenges we'd faced and, and, and had a few laughs about what to do with them along the way. And then we said, well, wouldn't it be fun if we could bring this discussion into the legal space and talk about it on the podcast? So... I'm really grateful for you to give it, giving up your time to to do this. How about you, both of you kick off just with um, your own personal experiences? Because you've both got kids, haven't you, who've got a particular condition which is considered neurologically diverse. So, why don't you kick off? Second, so um, yeah. So my, my eldest is diagnosed, labelled ADHD. Um, diagnosed at about seven years old. Uh, we went through the usual denial process of. You're all mad. He's fine. He's perfect because he's quite sharp, um, but we're struggling to access curriculum. Um, I'm sure we'll get to that at some point in relation to the system disabling uh, them rather than them being disabled, um, which I think is a, an important piece. But um, he, he struggled with curriculum, so we we eventually took him out. So he's online schooled now, uh, and he's online schooled in the American curriculum, so he's with a U.S. school, um, predominantly based around the fact that he, he's a very keen sports person and that, that works from in relation to fitting into the time schedule for how he uh, participates in sports. And my second child is um, 
suffered from social anxiety, so she was a school refuser. So she's now a hybrid of bricks and mortar and homeschooled uh, or online schooled. So yeah, I, I've I've had a challenge with two of the three, and the third one is neurotypical um, slash much easier to get to school. Um, and, and I guess less of a challenge in terms of the stress levels that it causes because, you know, trying to fight the system uh, to get a result for your children is a uh, somewhat arduous task and very, very, very painful, as you guys both know. Well, indeed, and we, we, we certainly will get onto education system and, and other aspects of society which, which can provide a challenge. But speaking of challenges, just before we bring Joanna in, I, mean, I know from personal experience that when you have priorities at home, which are forcing you outside of your comfort zone, or outside of the norm, that they uh, need some tackling. How have you managed to successfully do that with balancing your very considerable responsibilities as one of the leaders of the MAP group? Um, I, I, you know, I, I guess I, I've, we're, we're certainly in the privileged few space. So um, my wife gave up work to make sure that the kids were well catered for and you know while we were living in Qatar she worked quite a bit and we had lots of help over there in terms of being able to afford it and stuff which was again a privilege but when we came back here that we didn't really have any support infrastructure in terms of family friends whatever else so um she's t- taken that on board herself to provide the support in the homeschool environment as well as obviously running them up and down to the bricks and mortar elements as well so I, I've been very lucky that she's been there to kind of pick that all up and then I, I swan in kind of have some dinner, go to bed and swan out again. Yeah, that sounds it's like... not quite that easy. <laughs> fair, fair, fair play to Mrs. Cullen, first of all. But jo- Joanna, I guess, same questions to you. First of all, perhaps you share with us your personal experience. Yeah, so my youngest is age 10 at the moment. Um, I guess from fairly early on, we knew that there were things there that weren't our experience necessarily with our eldest daughter. Um, Joseph, now 10, as I say, is quite a complex makeup. He was first diagnosed with ADHD and is now medicated for ADHD. Um, But there's quite a lot of complexity that I'm sure we'll come on to into neurodiversity. So he has a range of what are termed as conditions in there uh, that we see as more superpowers. Um, So ASC, um, he has tics disorder, motor motor and vocal tics disorder. He has sensory processing challenges. He has sleep disorder. So quite the mix in there, which I guess plays to the point about, you know, neurodiversity is very complex and not linear and everybody's different and everybody's unique. Um, In terms of the experience, it's been much like Brian, a roller coaster. Certainly with the school system, we have the absolute privilege now of having been able to move our children to a school, which is just spectacular. Prior to that, we had... Uh, a fight for years for want of a better expression um, and we've very much seen firsthand the the way that the system generally and society lets young people and people people of all ages down um, so yeah in terms of managing that um, you just roll with it don't you you know what you know and Keep your, your children, are, your children <laughs> are the most incredible things and yeah we just, just deal with it my husband and I kind of juggle well, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? And it's it, whilst that's challenging, I still think that in a family situation, the kids seeing that partnership of two two partners or husband and wife or whatever it might be, working together for the greater good has, has got a real positivity to it. But you are right that these barriers that get put up, both for children in these circumstances and also for, for the parents and, and the family, of course, that has consequence further down the track in terms of a number of respects. But before we maybe get stuck into them, I mean, let, let's let's clarify for everyone who's watching and listening. We're talking about neurodiversity. So what, what do we mean? Are we all neurodiverse, Brian? I think so. Uh, you know, what's, what's neurotypical? What's typical anything? You know, every business you talk to is different. Every person you talk to is different. You know, every environment you come into is different. You know, so what, what's typical as a word in itself? But neurotypical is, is for me broadly offensive because wouldn't you hate to just be like everyone else you know and take personalities out of it and I think the you know society trying to label people neurotypical neurodiverse ADHD you know autistic you know lesbian gay whatever you know it's just a, a symptom of a society that 
feels it needs labels for whatever reasons so they can compartmentalize people into boxes. And I think, you know, we seem to be losing our creativity. We seem to be losing our identity. We seem to be losing our tribes because they're kind of harder to find because you've been boxed into one that you maybe don't fit into, but you've been given a label. So therefore you're in that box. And you're like, I want to be in that box over there because that's creativity or whatever. And I, I think there's a real risk that by labeling people neurodiverse or neurotypical limits the contribution that we can receive from them um, or that those that are neurotypical can give to everyone else as well because you're not neurotypical because there's no such thing. No, I mean, that's got to be right, hasn't it, Joanna? I mean, I think 100%. of that ne- neuro- neurotypical. I mean, you know, you particularly when you're thinking about kids, I mean, there's different levels of creativity, there's different levels of confidence, there's different levels of anxiety, and <clears throat> I tend to agree with Brian that if we just try and say, well, that 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 six-year-old is like that because they are this, and, and that, that's just how it is. There's no cure. It's a condition. It's a disorder. And that they're like this forever, and that's bad. That, it just seems to me that maybe that's not the best way of dealing with it. Absolutely. I, I 100% agree. I think, the you know, I don't agree with the terms neurotypical and neurodiverse. I think the only thing in the diversity part of neurodiversity is that it is massively complex and everybody is unique and different. I think trying to pigeonhole people into a box that says X, Y, or Z is really, really dangerous. And, you know, everybody is unique in their own special way. I had a meeting with the the Senko of seniors this morning and her first question to us was, tell us about Joseph and his strengths. And I thought that was a really positive way of looking at things because, again, it's not about the box or the definition. And the the only time, I guess, sort of labelling can be useful is unfortunately to get through the struggle of getting help and getting assistance Mm. with with certain measures that you need or support. But it shouldn't be that way. Again, it's, it's way too restrictive and the stigma still that exists around it is just so totally unnecessary, but it's there. It is there. And, you know, it's probably a, an interesting point that we think about, well, you know, how how could, what potential positives are there in someone who has certain characteristics? Because there always, always is, isn't there? I mean, from my perspective, just just touch starting perhaps with the, the education system, I, I know this issue of the fight you, you you face. Um, I mean, the first thing we've got to acknowledge here, schools are providing education at scale. They have um, an awful lot of pressure upon them, which in itself, I think is, if anything, it's increased in recent years through the advent of social media, through um, uh, the, the different challenges that kids of all shapes, sizes, and indeed diversity present. But it seems to me that certain schools, I'm not sure there's a pattern just in terms of the conversation I have between say the private and the public sector. I don't think it's as straightforward as that. But it seems to me that some schools within that provision of education at scale don't have the sort of sophistication in the way they teach or just the way they treat kids to be able to say, well, you know, we're not going to be able to just adopt a one-size-fits-all approach to the curriculum. Was that something you, you encountered, Brian? Yes. <laughs> so so I, have a, I have a real challenge with the system. Um, we, we, we've spoken before in our, our, our conversations around this, which is, you know, we work in an education system that was built for the industrial age, which was built to create a, a you know, people in rows, all wearing the same uniform, all having to queue up in the yard before they go in to sit at the desk, to be quiet, to listen, to not have an opinion, um, because it was built for a manufacturing environment on on the back of wartime. Um, And I think it just beats the creativity out of of children because they don't want it. They want you to be a foot soldier. They want you to be someone who's going to, you know, listen, action, deliver, listen, action, deliver, go home. You know, and it, I can understand why it was built, but it, it's not fit for purpose for today. And there's, there doesn't seem to be any desire to to revisit or relook or take a risk on it. Um, you know, you look at Finland where children are children until they're nine. 
So they go into the educational environment and it's about learning through play and through discovery and through creativity. Um, and then they start curriculum by the time they're, when they hit nine. But by then they've actually learned times tables, how to spell, how to read, etc. but through a different uh, methodology, which is play and discovery. So they're no further behind by the time they hit nine, but they've done it in a significantly different way, which creates a much more creative mind. I was kind of reflecting, you know, before we came in on some of the experiences that we had in school. And I was thinking back to during COVID times, the fun times we had um, uh, online with schools. And I remember listening in on one of my young lad, the, the youngest is nine, and the teacher, and, and she's a terrible teacher, um, was saying, you know, another word for bigger. I need, Luke, give me another word, word for bigger. Luke is this other kid in the school. And uh, he went, oh, gigantic. And she went, no, you're wrong. I was thinking massive. And I was like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's, a, you know, when you're kind of going, shit, I want to hit on mute, yeah. but you're yeah. kind of too late. And you're thinking, oh my God, there's someone who's kind of like given the right answer, but she's like, no, this is what you, you must say because this is what I want you to say. And I just kind of thought, you know, that's such a simple reflection of, you know, creativity being beaten out or thinking slightly differently th being beaten out. And it's just, it, that just permeates its way through. And any child that doesn't necessarily fit that or any child that doesn't fit that industrial age box, which is like from a, another era, is, is thought to be different or yeah. have a disorder or be neurodiverse. They're not neurodiverse. They're individual and every child's individual. But the problem, certainly in the United Kingdom and in Ireland where I'm from, obviously, is that we're not prepared to take a punt on trying somewhere diff something different. Whereas you look at Finland, that is no worse off educationally, in fact, better. But the children are allowed to be children and allowed to have an experience that's really positive. And what, what happens there is that, um, you know, the, I hate at school. Uh, and because I, I'm 99% sure I'm neurodiverse. Um, but I think I've done pretty well. You know, so education is just a small part, but I hated it, you know, but through time I've learned to love to learn. So I love reading stuff. I love, you know, listening to not necessarily pod podcasts, but audible books and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm three hours a day in the car. So I try to go through a couple of books a week or whatever, you know, but I've learned to love to learn. And that's what's happening in Finland. They are learning to love to learn because they're all accepted for being individuals and learning in a different way. And over here, I think you develop a hatred of learning if you're, not neurotypical um, because it's forced upon you. And if you don't do it in the, the way that they dictate, you're wrong. So you're taught that you're wrong in the way that you want to live your life. And therefore you have to fit a box and you're boxed in very quickly. I mean, that's right. I mean, you've, you've really piqued my interest with that, 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 uh, what seems to me to be a very astute observation that we're not prepared to take risks in order to find the solution. Mm -hmm. And is, do you think, what, I mean, the way I think this through is we, th at this moment, the education system is largely dictated by the government and certainly funded largely through the government. The government exists in the short term only. It exists through four-year electoral cycles. That's not very long. Therefore, if a certain party of any persuasion gets into power, what they are probably thinking, or what they might be thinking, is we need here punchy, short-term messages which tick the electorate's boxes, which is going to get us in on a second occasion. And 10-year plans, 15-year plans, we're making fundamental seismic change to something like the education system. That is going to untick as many boxes as it ticks. It's not worth taking the risk. It's it's too um, it's too potentially threatening from the from the perspective of being reelected. Let's just not go there. Do, do you think the system counts against that almost entrepreneurial approach to to change? But absolutely, I think, and you know, I think we've all seen examples of te teachers work tremendously hard, and there is a huge resourcing challenge. We were talking about this earlier, mm. so you know. We're definitely not about criticising individual teachers. We've seen the best of what they do, but you're absolutely right. It's very hard to change something for the long term and there isn't that long-term vision. The this, this kind of simplest example I guess I ever saw of that was when Joseph was about five and was being taught to write and they had this crazy cursive handwriting on the curriculum that he really struggled with because from a yeah. processing perspective, he struggled to hold a pencil a little bit. And... You know, I was asking the question, why does it matter whether he writes in this flowery style 
and fits it into a box because by the time he hits 16 or 18, he probably won't need to type, let alone write, because everything will be audio recognition. You know, it just won't be a thing anymore. So why are we not teaching our children future ready skills around teamwork, around collaboration, around around creativity, emotional intelligence, all the things that are genuine skills they'll need because cursive handwriting and being able to join up in a certain way for a child who has either sensory processing issues or, you know, um, there are certain conditions within the spectrum, as we as we know, that have dyspraxia. Children with dyspraxia really struggle to hold a pencil sometimes. Mm. So why are we focusing and honing in on that rather than actually creating an environment that works by the same token? I think it's very easy to get it right. And I've seen spectacular you know, really spectacular examples of individual teachers. So after Joseph moved schools, he was overwhelmed to go onto stage as part of a class assembly, but there was no issue made over that. And they said, how can we, you know, what would you like to do? And he ended up operating the curtain and doing all the curtain changes. So he felt absolutely integrated into that team. He wasn't excluded by virtue of the fact he wasn't on the stage front and centre. So again, I think there's, you know, we do have really strict sort of confines in terms of the curriculum, but equally the ways and means in which by the smallest of actions, individuals can hugely help those who maybe don't fit into that box by making them not feel excluded and different when there's actually no reason to, because their strengths are over there, but as part of the same team. Well, that, that's absolutely right. And I think the other thing to bring in, you mentioned auto recognition. I mean, the, the speed at which technology is developing now. Have, have either of you had to go at ChatGPT yet? This is the one that was just bought by... It's just been bought yeah. by Microsoft. Yeah, Microsoft. I'm, yeah. I've got yeah. slightly addicted to it. I had um, <laughs> Catriona Wolfenden, uh, partner at Waitman's, on the podcast a little while ago, and Kat told me about it. But I've, I signed up to it, and I'm addicted. I mean, it is the most rem- – and it, it's only in its first version. It's still really in the testing phase. But bl- the way it works is you go onto what they call the playground, and you type in broadly what you want ChatGPT chat to write for you. So I go in and say, write me a 500-word blog about the importance of risk-taking in business. And it writes me, punctuation perfect, grammar perfect, very reasoned, 500-word blog. Now, I played around with that concept, and I said, write me a 500-word blog on risk-taking, which is very empathetic. And it changed it. It made it more persuasive, less, a little mm. bit less abrasive. But then if you go on and say, write a critical piece on this, it will say, you know, people who don't take risks will never achieve their potential. So the machine has learned to take a concept that, it's, that is sort of set out for it by a human being, but then just process it in a way that either the human can take away in its entirety or can adapt for their own personality. Mm. Now, my gut feel is telling me that the education system embracing a piece of technology like that, I mean, I hope it's in our lifetime, but I, I'm not that optimistic because with something like your cursive handwriting, Joanna, I mean, you think to yourself, well, hang on, if we're all going to be using this sort of AI in the future to generate our, our prose, to, do, to generate our content, well, I mean, it makes even more of a nuisance to the yeah. fact that not only will you not go near a pencil, you might not even go through the process exactly. of, of having to be to able to start place. from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Do, what do you think? Do you think? Sorry, go on, Joanna. I, I was just going to say, do you know what's most interesting is probably the algorithms that sit behind that technology, almost guaranteed, will have been written by people who are deemed classified, labelled as neurodiverse. Yes. Because the people who have the brains to be able to find the amazing innovation that creates things like that are almost invariably what is labelled neurodiverse. It's interesting, isn't it? Because... The, I mean, when you talk about AI, you're usually talking about algorithms, which yeah. is code. It's, yeah. it's about someone who's written code. Yeah. And our legal tech business, Zeus, we've now got a number of um, trainees there, a number of apprentices who are autistic or, or um, have some other element that they're not neurotypical. Mm. And what we've seen is that their pattern recognition skills are quite remarkable. And of course, coding software development is often about some sort of pattern recognition. Podcast today is brought to you by Zeus Tech Solutions, who provide dev on demand for law firms. When I was managing partner of a law firm, recruiting and retaining top tech talent 
was one of the biggest challenges. And we're still, because we didn't have the knowledge in the business to manage and coach a technical team, it was a constant cycle of frustration, downtime, lost revenue, and proclaim line dormant. Well, for the past five years, Zeus have looked after both of Spiring Group's law firms in the UK and Australia, and it's been a game changer. Now, we get all of our tech on tap, from IT director to .NET developer, we get that whenever we want. Zeus provide the best use of tech to all of our fee earners with no recruitment fees and absolutely no nonsense. So if you're a law firm who are frustrated with their tech anywhere in the world, go to www.zeustechsolutions.co.uk and hit the live chat option and the answer to all of your tech solutions, however specific they are, is right there. Better still, if you mention that you heard about Zeus on the podcast, you will get a free health check for your case management system. So that's Zeus Tech Solutions, Dev On Demand for law firms, and now on with the podcast. So I think we'll come on to this later when we think about, well, what are the actual advantages? Yeah. What are the opportunities? Yeah. What do you think, Brian? Do you think this issue of the education system embracing the technology that's out there and is emerging and perhaps focusing on moving at the pace the technology moves rather than moving at their own pace. Do you think that's realistic? Do you think it's desirable? It's absolutely desirable. Is it realistic? It hasn't proven to be. Um, if, you know, if you think that they're still teaching cursive writing, you know, which is really probably gone 20 years now yeah. uh, as a requirement, really, for real life. I don't, you know, I'm working 25 years and I've never done anything <laughs> other than type on a computer <laughs> or write on a iPad. Um, so in terms of its ability to, to kind of, I, I think it's very hard to keep up with technology because the speed of technological cha change is just massive. Um, I think the lack of desire to change is a bigger problem. Because it's one thing to try keep up, but it's another thing to actually ignore. And I actually think they're in the latter. I think they're absolutely in ignore technology and ignore, you know, Joanna's point around, you know, you won't need cursive writing because, you know, you know, chat GPT, for example, it's like, you know, it, I, I did read a report that it, it fooled a university professor oh, no, it on, passed, a, on a paper that was done. They passed the it paper. passed the law exam. You know, so, uh, you know. Education, like I say, it's a bit, you know, as it goes back to my earlier point, it was built for an industrial age, which is back in the, the 40s and 50s. You know, it's not, it's not adjusted since then. I'm not seeing it adjusting anytime soon. I think your point around, you know, every government kind of being temporary, so therefore there's no real long-term vision for it. You know, there's Sir Jim Robinson, who, who talked at length about individual students being, you know, treated differently. You know, he obviously became a lord on the back of it and died recently, sadly, quite young. But he was... He was theoretically game-changing in his view of education, but yet they didn't listen. So they're happy to give him, you know, a knighthood, yeah. but then actually do nothing about it. So that, you know, they recognize that they should, but the actual desire is not to do, to, is to do nothing. You know, I, I think where I have a bit of a challenge is that they're prepared to accept the status quo because they don't feel it needs change. But yet... You know, I would have said the same about Brexit. There wasn't a need to change. But when there's a desire to do it for a political reason, you can do it. So That's unless there's the right level of political pressure to make change happen, it won't happen. I mean, that's an interesting comparison, Brian, because it is appropriate in that that wasn't just sort of a societal shift or a structural shift. We, so, we, we somehow found the money, didn't we, yeah. <laughs> to, to make all of the changes that, that, that are required for Brexit. Uh, perhaps to be that's... fair, it was an... It, an an internal party challenge to satiate Tory infighting. Yeah. You know, but it became a public challenge. So what we need is some, <laughs> someone in the political sectors, Great either point. Labour, Tories, you know, Lib Dem, whatever, whoever's in government, to have some infighting that will cause it to change because it's not going to be publicly driven because, let's be honest, you know, what we're talking about is somewhat the minority, but it's only minority based on the labels that are applied. You know, we, we started the conversation with everyone's neurodiverse in some way, shape or form. So we just need to leverage people's understanding of that. And, you know, podcasts like this are fantastic because it shines a light on the fact that change needs to happen. And what you need to do is get that rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling until it actually becomes a movement. And that's where movements happen. 
change happens. Completely. And you'd, whilst I think you're right about it, we're talking about a minority here, when I was looking at the the, the statistic, because we were chatting when we about, before about the Harvard um, article mm. that I sent to you, which friends we're going to include in the uh, in in the commentary section wherever you're watching or listening but i tell you what one in 42 boys has some form of neurodiversity diagnosis not as many girls what 100 one in 180 but if you look at that one in 42 for boys i just did some back of a fag packet maths earlier if you that's like 2 2 to 3% so say 2 and a half percent if we think about 14 million ish uh, men at working age, that means 400,000, even on the basis of current science, current diagnosis, um, at working age who potentially are facing challenges when they move to the later stages of, of their life. I mean, it's a sizable minority. So most people watching are lawyers or um, legal tech or generally in the, the legal community. And obviously both of you as leaders in that field. Joanna, what do you think is about the, do you think the legal workplace as it is now faces particular challenges for those who have these particular characteristics that we're talking about? Absolutely, because I think as a sector, generalising here, but as a sector, it's pretty archaic, isn't it? Yes. In terms of approach to workforce, people, the way we treat people, the way we treat clients is, again, very traditional. And I think it'd be remiss of us to treat ourselves any different in many ways than the education sector as a sector at large. I think it is a massive challenge because things just aren't recognised. And there is, again, that sort of cookie cutter approach, which is lawyer based, actually not client based around the way we approach legal work. So, you know, everything is built in the same way. Lawyers are expected to behave more or less in the same way. And there is perhaps a lack of creativity and sort of looking at things differently in terms of how we can really harness skills and use skills in a different way. I think that the legal sector has for all too long expected a lawyer to be all things to all people, to be a business developer, to be good yeah. with clients, to manage a team. And you end up with your best technical lawyer being promoted to partner and then they have to manage a team. Whereas actually, is that person a really good technical lawyer and they should be sat doing the legal research, pulling together the legal argument. Are they the right person to lead and manage a team? Are they the right person to go and harness new clients? Probably not. Yeah. And we're really trying to do a lot of work in terms of actually how do you really play to someone's strengths and how do you totally forget people's because you know we focus too much on trying to improve and work on our areas for development rather than just focus on our strengths and really hone in on those it's almost like the continuation of the education theory isn't it let's do all of these subjects and do you know most of them badly rather than doing some really well and focusing on where we can really excel if we applied that same principle on a macro level to the legal sector and focused really on how we can use people's strengths better, they'll be happier, they'll be their best selves at work because we'll get more out of them. And that plays into everything. It's sort of the way offices are set up. It's the whole spectrum of the way the legal sector operates. So masses of opportunity. There is, and, and there is, I mean, although, you know, let's get it right. You know, if, if I compare where the, the the legal sector is now compared to sort of 20, 25 years ago, it has progressed in some ways. However, even if we think about the academic route that the majority of lawyers are compelled to go through before they qualify, before they can think about areas like partnership, I mean, that is, I mean, I, I mean, just, I, I mean, I qualified as a lawyer. I couldn't remember any blooming case names. <laughs> There was only, I can only remember one now, and I, I had enough trouble when I was I was going through my degree. The only one I remember is um, neither of you from a legal background, are you? But there was this one case involving a slug in a bottle of pop that was the basis of, of common law negligence in the UK. That was called Donahue v Stevenson, forty five. I can still remember it. But I mean, to be in a situation where students are required to be able to regurgitate at the drop of uh, you know d d regulations, case yeah. names. It's hardly going to be conducive so to someone who, whose memory isn't great. <laughs> okay, so there's another pet hate of mine. Um, and another reason why we've moved my eldest from the UK system into the US system, which is that examining by rote. So basically, you can do nothing all year and then cram for a couple of months and then hope that you remember enough 
<laughs> to get you through <laughs> when you've got short-term memory issues as he does. It's just nigh and impossible. And the level of stress, et cetera, that that was causing is ridiculous. Whereas in the American system now that he's in, it's um, weekly assessments. And it's just a weekly assessment where he sits with the tutor and goes through, this is where I'm at, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing. They'll have a look through all the paperwork and everything that he's submitted and move him on to the next level. Um, even to the point where they're now talking through, you know, the university entry process in the States. And it's, they don't... <laughs> That in many of the 1,500 of the universities and states now, because on the back of COVID with the challenges with kind of exams and stuff, they don't use exam scores anymore. So they do, they, they take a little look at your GPA average. They, they, they don't do SATs anymore for these 1,500, but they take, they, they'll interview you. They want to know what you've done in society from a charity point of view. They want to know what you've done in your com community from a tribe point of view in terms of how you reach out within the... So they, they're testing the whole individual around who you are, what you are, and how you behave for the longer term, rather than saying, you know, your whole future is going to be predicated on three weeks worth of exams in the summer when it's sunny and you can't go outside and you're going to be really fed up because you can't go outside and you're going to have to study and hopefully remember what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So the whole, you know, a system that's based on memory is not a practical system for the real world because there's not a single thing that we do within the legal sector, within our business, et cetera, that we can't look up on Google. You know, so, yeah. you know, our ability to understand, you know, our ability to find information is a gift. And I think that's one that should be taught. Emotional intelligence is a gift that we should be taught because that's around exactly all the stuff that we're talking about. It's the ability to understand everyone's different and therefore treat them in a way that's, you know, going to work for them as well as for you. Uh, and I think exams by rote, and even government stuff, you know, focusing on we need more exams around maths. You know, how many people can access maths curriculum in a really comprehensive way and understand it? You can't force that in because that's what industry needs. You know, it's industry's challenge to teach people the skills within the sectors that they move into. It's our challenge as a society to produce, you know, to be fair, the school that Aaron did go to, the one thing that I loved that the principal always talked about is we are not looking for A-star students. We're looking to produce A-star people. And I just thought that's so perfect. And, you know, the focus on mathematics and academics and all, exa all exams being on a rote basis is just beyond me in terms of producing people that are going to be productive in the world that we live in because yeah. they're just not. You know, what they could be is technically brilliant. They could be able to sit in their room for seven hours a day and study and have zero ability to interact with another human being. And that just can't work because 100% of our customers are people, 100% of our staff are people, 100% of our suppliers are people, all enabled by technology. But, you know, being purely academic is a real challenge, I think, for people that are coming into a real world society. Definitely. And the challenges would continue, as you've just said, it, once, once they're in a particular place of employment. I mean, you mentioned the office environment, Joanna. Yeah. I mean, I guess, first of all, you've got the recruitment process, you've got an induction process, you've then got an, a, an office plan. A lot of us work open plan these yeah. days. Um, noisy people on the phones, fire alarms yeah. going off, people stomping around. <laughs> and, you know, if, if I look at my kids, I mean, Amelia, the eldest, she she has a bit of a problem with loud, sudden noises. noises. And I'm thinking if she was in a classroom or in due course an office yeah. space and something like that happened, I think she'd struggle. So yeah. is there any solutions there, do you think? Masses. And we get so excited about this because we're, and it, it's, a, it's a work in progress. We need to carry on raising the bar. But what we're trying to do is so end to end people journey with our businesses. We're trying to get to a point where we recruit. So, you know, to Brian's point, we're not that interested in grades. Grades tell you something, but they tell you this much about a whole picture. So we're looking much more at what appeals to individuals. So when we recruit, we're asking people rather than sending us a CV, so that's a piece of paper, anyone can write one, to tell us their why, to tell us what motivates them, what gets them out of bed in the morning. We try and get them to do that through whatever channel they like. So some people send a TikTok to the technology point. Some people will send a CV and that's fine. But we've equally had videos of people doing a walk to work and just chatting to us on the way to work. And this would be my journey from my front door to yours. So people's why gives you a real insight into their personality, into how they prefer to work. We're trying to get to the point then where, you know, we 
we recruit, we have map chats, so map to make a positive difference chat. So we're not looking at technical skill because you can teach anyone technical skill. You can't teach anybody those skills Brian was just talking about in terms of collaboration and everything that you actually need of a lawyer in terms of understanding their client. You know, we have loads of vulnerable clients, so that isn't taught in law school really. No. So we're looking at how people can contribute to a team and how people can enhance the team then through their experience with us. So for example, you mentioned the office space. That's absolutely true. So, and this is way more than a point on neurodiversity specifically. Every single person has their preferences in terms of how they want to work out, what makes them the most productive, the most happy in a working environment. So for example, Brian's big on the fact that people who are introverted, you know, don't want to sit in a busy corridor in an open plan area. It'll be their idea of hell. Other people may need a quiet space. So, you know, we're not there yet with that, but we're really looking at sort of working patterns, how people want to work. And I think recognition is everything, acknowledging that it's okay not to work in the middle of an open plan office if that is a real struggle for you. That's really important. So we need to carry on doing loads of work around this. But again, it comes back to those life skills. For us, what's most valuable is, you know, and I see it now in my children's school, some of the most valuable stuff isn't the curriculum, it's the beyond the curriculum stuff. It's the right, go shopping, what can you buy for yeah. under a tenner? Mm. It's the whole, the internet's down. What are you going to do? How are you going to run your life when there's no Wi-Fi? And getting them to think in a different way. It's that creative thinking, that problem solving. And those skills are so valuable for them. And again, that's what we're looking for in recruits is how do we bring a combination of everything? Because again, you don't want one type of skill. You want the whole range of different skills and collaboration approaches and everything. Because again, all clients are different. So we need to be able to approach it in that way as well. What do our clients want? Because can guarantee they don't want a lawyer in pinstripes sat well, behind a desk. Well, the, um, the, the client wants a solution, exactly. don't they? And you've, you've made a great point there, Joanna, about there is the ability to find a solution. I suppose it can have academic aspects to it, but it certainly isn't solely a, a memory issue or, or remembering. It's about using the tools and the experiences at your disposal to get your client from A to B. And that's what the client wants. The client's not about the means, the client's about the end. And it seems to me that um, there's a lot of, if, if somebody does have an issue with memory, if somebody has particular sensitivities around noise, I mean, we just use two very narrow observations there. I and mean, you think of something like a courtroom, you know, it's, it, it's, it would be a huge challenge. So maybe we, we can just sort of circle back now to this issue of solutions. Let's take the government out the equation for a moment. So sometimes I take them out full stop. <laughs> but um, it, it, let, let's, let's just work on the basis for now that it is for society to find the solutions in terms of unlocking the potential of this sizable minority of neurodiverse diagnosed people and to unlock their, their full potential. It seems to me there's no quick, you know, magic wand to wave. There needs to be some significant change. Where's the starting point, do you think? I know when we spoke last time, you'd already had some thoughts about how you guys or how maybe wider society could approach it. So, Brian, just or one of you. Uh, yeah, I think it, it kind of comes back to that starting point of it, you know, the system from an education point of view. So, I mean, certainly you know, philanthropically over time, when we can be philanthropic, um, we, we'd certainly be quite keen to to look at the education system. Um, jo Joanna spoke this, about this before, you know, if we can start with the pebbles that build the castle and just start laying those kind of foundations, you know, in an ideal world, we try set up a school that was specifically, not specifically for neurodiverse, because then you're labeling again, but a school that catered for them in a much more rounded way and a much more accepting way and a much more understanding way that everyone is different. You know, there's, I've looked at schools in the past, like Reggio Emilia in Italy. You're gonna, if you ever want to read up on that, that's a really interesting way. What's it called? Obviously, Reggio Reg Emilia. Reggio it's Emilia. a small village in uh, Italy, but it's it's all about outdoor, indoor education. And again, it's, it's quite like the, or the Finnish system, looking at the Finnish system and the way that comes in and just learning from people that are doing it as we'd see it in the right way in terms of, you know, just being more open-minded and, and less industrial 
Um, so that, I mean, from, from a, I don't even want to say from a philanthropic point of view, because it's not really, it's not, that sounds like you're giving to a charity or whatever. It's not, it's trying to help create change. Well, it's been, it's it, try, it, trying to be the change that we would want it to be. You know, and we, we, we've had a chat about this in the past about the, you know, uh, be, being players, not spectators. You know, it's very easy to sit back and criticize government and criticize the system and criticize everything else. It's the easiest thing in the world, isn't it? You know, it's like, it's the spectators at the football, you know, but go down there and try, you know, have a go at Chelsea at our level. It ain't going to happen, you know, but if, if you can, we, we can make stuff happen in this scenario, we can be the players, we can start making change happen and we can start bringing a team together. And we're really keen on trying to kind of meet other people that, that have similar challenges. And everyone we meet now, because, you know, you talk about th- that three or 4% diagnosed, Indeed. You know, keeping in mind that it, 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 you know, you went through the system at one point or a certain, yes. and it took three yes. and a half, four years yeah. to get, I didn't even bother. And again, we have the privilege of being able to go private. And I, I absolutely deem that a privilege because, you know, we would not be where we are with our children in, in terms of their development now if we didn't have that privilege. And, and I, I, I thank, you know, the universe or whatever every single day for the fact that we have that privilege. Very few people have that. So we're talking three or four percent. That probably equates to the three or four percent that are privileged enough to be able to get diagnosis. You know, my guess would be it'll be forty or fifty percent of people can actually be truly diagnosed. So I think it's a much, much, much bigger portion of society, and it's incumbent upon those of us that are privileged to try help the next generation through from the ground up. Well, because if, if you think of this, part of the problem here is that. If we continue to review some of these conditions that we've mentioned as like disorders, almost like an illness, well, that naturally leads people down a certain pathway. And that yeah. could have both ramifications for society. I mean, I, I remember I was reading up when I was prepping about the cost of adult social care. You know, if someone's just, you know, you're, you've got a disorder. So, you know, you imagine the impact that has on someone's mental health and on their confidence and upon how their, their pathway in their life works. So there is there's some real opportunities here. I mean, Joanna, I just wondered, we, we, we read all the time about we've got a, um, a crisis in terms of personnel, in terms of labour. I mean, this is not just the UK. This is a global issue. We've got an ageing population, and we've, we've not necessarily got the people coming up through the ranks to, to fill the jobs that we've got. Mm. And if we are talking about millions of people across the world who are not getting anywhere close to their potential. Imagine the advantages if we could unlock that. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we talk about the system and changing the system, but for me, a lot of it comes from awareness on the one hand, so education in a different way and kindness of individuals. Because again, I think even within a system, you can have lots of common sense approaches and simple kindness and open-mindedness and approach, which start to incrementally drive that change. And you're absolutely right. We've got this crisis and it's so frustrating because from a macro level, you can see it. You think, but if we just tweaked here and here on a really macro level, actually we could solve a load of these challenges in a really effective way. Um, You know, putting people through this one education system, this curriculum, when it doesn't work for them, when actually we could be harnessing skill in another area and actually people could be contributing to society and to the resourcing challenges that, as you say, we have on a world scale would be really, really helpful. So for me, that that change, we can absolutely drive that movement without changing. Because you're right, the government, you know, are unlikely on their four-year term to ever get to that change because it's no, it's not in their best interest. Therefore, why would they? But actually, I've seen over the last couple of years brilliant examples where individuals within sectors, and that, you know, that's within the education sector, but it's also within workforces. So people watching, if you know, if if people take anything away from our chat, it's just that open-mindedness to view people through a different prism and see things slightly differently. And if we make one single change, you know, a day, a week to be able to be more accommodating, to see people through a different lens and think, actually, we can harness that skill. I think that incremental change is what creates mm-hmm. that movement in many ways and helps us to move forward. You know, for me, the the impactful things that I remember for my children over the last year is the kind word from a teacher who's acknowledged and normalised. And normalising is absolutely crucial here. It's about not making 
making people stand out in the wrong way. So again, to your point about the words disorder, condition, I mean, what is that? You know, mm. you look at the spectrum, you look at dyscalculia and dyspraxia and dyslexia and, you know, the list is vast and there are combinations and none of us have to, you know, to where we started, what is neurotypical? What is that? And just treating people as people and not trying to fit into these societal constructs that we've set for years and years, but we compound them and we make them worse rather than actually saying, what's the common sense in that? Well, exactly. I love that phrase, incremental change that, that you use, Joanna, because, and I like it when we finish complex, quite you know, quite difficult subjects on the podcast with optimism. And I, I feel really optimistic after, after this discussion that there's a way forward here in terms of this generation who don't have disorders. What they have is variations of natural human characteristics. It feels to me that there's a really positive way forward. But obviously, just to wrap up, Lots of law firms watching now uh, will know about the MAP Group, will know that you guys have been uh, very successful in terms of building your alliance of law firms and the values that drive you is such a key part, clearly, of your, of your business strategy and who you are as people as well. But if there's a law firm who are, are watching or listening now thinking, well, where do I start? You know, I do interview people who either tell me that they are autistic, for example, or who clearly just have certain um, different traits. Where, where, do they, where does someone who wants to get started in this optimistic journey, maybe if you could both give them a top tip, where, where do they start? I think ask them. My yeah. advice would be ask them, say, you know, for us, it's about harnessing superpowers. It's about identifying mm. and harnessing superpowers. So, you know, ask ask people where, you know, what makes you alive? What makes you tick? Where do you think you can add the most value to our organisation and to yourself and to your own development? Uh, I think asking, uh, the basic fundamentals I, I just think asking. That's, that's from the corporate side. I, I think yeah. for, for the for the individual, I think it's really important for them because I, I think that the mistake I always made when I was, you know, starting out and work and coming through was I was also always asking, you know, when they could say at the end, oh, is there any questions you want to ask us or whatever? It was always, you, oh, you know, where you go, where do you see, where's your five-year plan, blah, blah, blah. Well, kind of bullshit answers or questions really, you know, the, the, the typical questions. I think it's really important now that, you know, individuals are asking the business, what, you know, what will they do for you? It has to be a two-way arrangement. I always saw it as the employer employee so therefore i was subservient to the employer it has to be a relationship now yeah. and i think if, if you know if if you're not neurotypical you absolutely i think and it's hard and it's probably especially hard for for neurodiverse people to actually say you know this is where i and be honest about it because there is that label bit but to be able to say you know i i'm neurodiverse in whatever way i'm adhd or i'm you know autistic or whatever and say you know what you know, what way do you, do you treat that and how do you see that and what way would you look at it and, you know, what would you be able to do for me in that scenario and not be scared to ask that question. And if, if, if an employer is not be able to give you an answer, it's not, it, it may be the right employer, but it's unlikely to be because they're not going to fit around you as an individual and it's going to end up feeling like school again, which I'd imagine would have felt pretty hard and crap, yeah. if I'm honest. So, you know, you don't want to be going from one institution to another. You want to be going to, you know, a, a tribe or a group that you feel really comfortable with who get you uh, and are accepted. You know, we, we make a really big deal within the MAP group businesses of bringing yourself to work, your true self, you know, not, not your facade, which I think is a big thing in legal, you know, around mm. that, that kind of my suit is my armor and blah, 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 you know, bring yourself to work, bring your yeah. true self to work. You know, I wear really crap socks or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, they're lovely. Joanna got them for me for Christmas. As, 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 as again. They're really lovely. But, you know, they, they, they wouldn't be the typical kind of, you know, senior leader of a law firm kind of, kind of well, who feel about. Who, you know? who would want to be typical? No. And maybe maybe that's, a, maybe that's a, 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 the optimistic point to wrap up, but certainly you guys aren't typical in terms of, <laughs> in terms of leaders of, of, of law firms. And it's been, it's been so great to have your company and you've added such a lot of value to, to the debate. And I think this is one wheel that will run and run. So perhaps 
a couple of years down the line, we can come back and, and see where the debate is and see where we all are, all are as legal leaders. So thank you, Brian, Joanna, for your company. Thanks for everyone for listening and watching. See you back every other Wednesday on From the Courtroom to the Boardroom. See you later. Bye.